we, uh, if we were following Ruby's lead up here in the front, we would, we would be a full charismatic church. She was uh, slain in the spirit. She was dancing in the spirit. She was uh, at one point swimming in the spirit. So, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we are going to be meeting at uh, Charity and Ryan's house for our, we just found that out, so they're, they're wanting us to, uh, to join them there at their newly constructed home. Uh, I'll, I'll send you out uh, directions, uh, kind of a Google map, you can just click on it and hopefully be able to find your way to their location, and so Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, smorgasbord, whatever you want to bring to, to eat will be just great, um, so hope you'll, hope you'll join us. Uh, if you'll take your Bibles and turn over to Acts chapter 23. We're continuing our, our uh, journey with Luke as he chronicles the growth of the early church and, and as Paul will be making his way to the great city of Rome eventually. And so we're in chapter 23 this morning. Luke writes, verse 1, Paul, looking intently at the, the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystanders said, Do you revile God's high priest? Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all of them. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Verse 11, But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at Paul's side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We've bound ourselves under a solemn oath of taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation, and we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister, Paul's nephew, heard of their ambush and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul and Paul called one of the centurions to him and said lead this young man to the commander for he has something to report to him so he took him and led him to the commander and said Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you and the commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately what is it that you have to report to me And the young man said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the uh, council as they were going to inquire something more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves under a curse to not either eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one that you have notified me of these things. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. 
And they were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter having this form. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews, Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. And I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. And when they were informed that there would be a riot against this man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. By the next day, but the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. When those had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When he had read it, he asked from what province he was, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also. Give orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Whew. That was a lot of verses. It's interesting, David's song choices this morning, we did not confer at all about what I was going to talk about and the song choices that he made, but the, the song choices you saw really had to do with our comfort and and our encouragement in the Lord in the midst of life's uncertainties and sorrows. And uh, I got to tell you, personally, if I did not believe and trust in the good hand of the Lord upon my life and that he was working out the different details of my life for my good, I would have despaired a long time ago. There certainly have been countless joys, many victories in my life, but there have also been many, many sorrows. There have been failures, and and there have just been heartaches at different times. And If I did not trust and believe that through it all, the Lord was guiding and directing and having his way, I would have thrown in the towel long ago. And when it comes to such consolation and hope, Uh, I think of George Whitfield. I think about how that he was stabbed in the back by his friend John Wesley. He lost a great deal of the following that he had. He spent much of his life as a bachelor. And then when he was only married for a short time, he lost his wife. And yet he said this, quote, Nothing could possibly support my soul under the many agonies which oppress me, but a consideration of the freeness, eternity, and unchangeableness of God's love to me. Men and devils may do their worst. Our Jesus will suffer nothing to pluck us out of his almighty hands. Not only do I think about George Whitfield, but I think about uh, William Carey, the father of the modern missionary movement. You, You might know that after Carey had come to India and had spent about 20 years of his ministry of translating the Bible into the, their vernacular, writing grammars, all kinds of stuff, there was this great fire, fire like we've seen in paradise. And, and it destroyed almost all of his work, burned it up, toast. And he wrote to his nephew Eudas, Eustace, and he said, quote, This is a heavy blow, and it will stop our printing the scriptures for a long time. I wish to be still and know that the Lord is God, and to bow to his will in everything. He will no doubt bring good out of this evil and make it to promote his interests, but at present, the providence is indeed exceedingly dark. You can trust in the Lord's good hand upon your life and still say at the same time that the providence is painful, right? I also think about Joseph, of course, from the scriptures. You remember Joseph sold into slavery by his own brothers, spent years in prison because of a false accusation of sexual assault. And then finally, when he he had his brothers standing before him after years had gone by, what did Joseph say to them? He said, Genesis chapter 50, 50, verse 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. 
It was his trust and his hope in God's sovereign hand upon his life that gave him consolation and hope. Let me just say this, friends. We, We have God's sure promises toward this very end. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know, the Lord says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. And of course, David referred to Romans 8, 28. The promise of all promises, for we know that all things, how many things? All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things, the hard things of our life. Exceedingly precious promises. And and we can be sure, and this brings us to Acts chapter 23, we can be sure that the Apostle Paul, who wrote Romans 8, 28, believed that about his own life as he sat there within the fortress Antonia, as he wondered, what in the world is going on in my life? I'm sure that he struggled with discouragement and disappointment as the rest of us do. Now remember, from what we saw last time, just bringing us up to speed, Paul was battered and bruised. He had been caught up in this riot we've seen in chapters 21 and 22 there at the temple, being falsely accused of preaching against the law and against the temple, and even accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple to profane the temple. And even after the Roman commander, Claudius Lysias, had the Roman soldiers taken Paul and brought him nearly into the fortress Antonia, and he gave him permission to speak to the Jews. But even after Paul again presented his testimony to the Jews, they were up in arms once again, and they would have torn him into pieces. And after threatening, bringing him inside and threatening to have Paul scourged, but learning that Paul was a Roman citizen, and it would have been illegal for Claudius Lysias to have done that to a Roman citizen, uh, even after after that, Claudius Lysias was baffled. He was wondered, why all of the uproar? Why do they hate this guy so much? Why do they want to kill him? And so we come to the end of chapter 22, verse 30, and we read, But the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he, that is Claudius Lysias, the commander there, released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And what we see within the the rest of chapter 23 really is a demonstration of the outworking of God's providential purposes within the Apostle Paul's life, and there's much here for us to learn for ourselves. I want you to notice, first of all, in verses 1 through 5, I would call it a a loss of cool on Paul's part. It's a loss of cool. Uh, Keep in mind that the the context of uh, for verses 1 through 11, it's not a formal trial where Paul is... Is, is on trial with formal charges being presented against him. This is really a, a fact-finding mission on the part of Claudius Lysias as the commander there to find out what's going on with this guy. And the setting was not within the fortress Antonio, Antonia into which the Jews never would have gone, nor was it within the official meeting place of the Sanhedrin because the Romans would not have been allowed into there. Most likely it was with some place in the open court area of the Temple Mount where the Romans would have been able to go and to have had this kind of convened meeting. That's the context. And it's the uh, Jewish council, it's the Sanhedrin, that has come together. And there were three main groups within the uh, Sanhedrin. Of course, there were the chief priests and some of their officials, officials who attended them. And then secondly, there were the elders, most likely the 70 elders patterned after uh, the Old Testament. You remember that Nicodemus was one of those 70 elders. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was one of those elders as well. And then finally, the third group was the group of scribes, that is the uh, the religious lawyers. So those three groups comprised this uh, religious ruling body of the Jews. Keep that in mind. Now, I just want to point out to you, uh, Just some things regarding Paul's demeanor and his approach that you see there within verse 1. 
Luke tells us that he was looking intently at the council. Interesting word choice on Luke's part because he, the other times that he uses it within the book of Acts, he uses it in chapter 1 where the disciples were looking intently at the sky as Jesus ascended back into heaven. It was also used in, a, in chapter 7, verse 55, of when Stephen was looking intently into heaven uh, at the right hand of the throne of God. You remember that. And so some people think that perhaps because of Paul's p- poor eyesight that he was, he was looking around. But more than likely, I think that Luke's point is, is that Paul is fearless. Paul is just, he's looking these guys squarely in the eye. Perhaps he's looking to see if there's any of those guys there that he recognized because he had probably been a member of the Sanhedrin earlier on before he was converted to Christ. Notice is also his uh, friendly address. Um, he doesn't start off with some kind of a formal uh, fathers and rulers of the people. No, he starts off with brethren. It, it would have been an endearing term, brethren. But it also signified to them that he saw himself as being on the same playing field as they were. Brethren. He refers to them as brethren. And then his plea, you see it right there. Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Now, don't mistake Paul. Paul is not making some claim to sinlessness in his own life. If there was anyone who was aware of his own sinfulness, it was the Apostle Paul. You remember what he wrote to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 15. He said that this is a faithful and true saying, deserving full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save what? Sinners among whom I am chief. Present tense, I am chief. So it's not a claim to sinlessness on his part, but but rather as as pertaining to any of the charges that might have been brought against him. You remember they were accusing him of preaching against the law, preaching against the temple. Pertaining to any of those charges, they were he was innocent. He was innocent of any of those charges. Then in verse 2, we see this unjust punch, this order that came from Ananias, the high priest, to be, for Paul to be smacked. Now, keep in mind, this was not just a slap. Tupto. It was a vicious punch. A.T. Robertson, the New Testament scholar, says the basic, basic sense is to stupefy by a blow. This was a vicious punch to the mouth. And the order came from this guy named Ananias, the high priest. Now, don't confuse this guy with other Ananiases. In the book of Acts, there are three different guys that are referred to as Ananias. It's not Ananias who was married to Sapphira. He's already dead. It's not Ananias, the, 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 the dedicated follower of Christ there at Damascus who came to the apostle Paul when Paul was blinded. It's not that Ananias. But this fellow is Ananias, the son of Nebadeus. And as one scholar says, one of the most cruel, evil, corrupt high priests ever to hold offices, or the office. According to Josephus, the historian, this fellow Ananias regularly robbed the tithes and and money that would have gone to to the more common priests. And he had punished those who resisted that. And he also paid high bribes to the Roman officials and to even the Jewish officials. This was a bad dude. I picture him as a kind of Vito Corleone, you know, from The Godfather. He's like a, he's like a Jewish mafia godfather, if you will. That's the kind of guy he is. But notice Paul's outburst, verse 3. God is going to strike you. Same word, tupto. God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, Paul says. Do you sit and try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Let me ask you this. Are you there with Paul? (laughs) If if you had been there that day and you're innocent of the charges and, and someone orders a guy standing next to you to haul off and just punch you in the mouth, wouldn't you respond in that kind of a way? I would. Probably get back in their face real quick. Um, it was humiliating for Paul. It was humiliating for Paul. Uh, and, and being a biblical scholar himself, Paul shot a zinger right back Ananias' way. God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. 
Um, now, scholars wonder what this is in reference to. It could be used somewhat in connection how, how Jesus called the, the religious leaders, you whitewashed tombs that are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. It could be in connection with that. But I, I want you to just turn over real quickly over to Ezekiel chapter 13 because I think that Ezekiel 13 is more the reference that is being made here in connection with false prophets. Ezekiel 13. And picking it up in, in verse 10, Ezekiel the prophet is writing in connection to false prophets who, you know, the false prophets during that day, judgment was going to come upon Israel, and the false prophets said, no, peace, peace, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to go well. Everything's going to go great. Verse 10, it's definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace, and when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash, you know, they, they make it look good. They dress it up. They dress it up. They plaster over with, with whitewash that it will fall. A flooding rain will come, and you, O oh, hailstones, will fall, and a violent wind will break out. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, where is the plaster with which you plastered it? You made it look so good. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a violent wind break out in my wrath, and there will also be in my anger a flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. I think that's what Paul is saying. He is, in other words, he's pointing back at Ananias, the high priest. You false prophet, God is going to strike you, you whitewash wall. He let him have it, kind of a sanctified trash talk, if you will. And yet, it was an outburst that Paul quickly regretted that he had made when he was rebuked. We see the rebuke. Do you revile God's high priest? Apparently, because Ananias, the high priest, maybe he didn't have the vestments on that would have, would have been normal for a high priest, or perhaps it was due to Paul's poor eyesight. He didn't recognize the guy. Or maybe it was because Paul had not been at Jerusalem for some time. He didn't know, really, who was high priest at that time. We don't know exactly Yet when he found out that the guy was high priest, Paul quickly recanted. You see it in verse 5, and he says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. In God's order of things, God is. it doesn't matter whether a ruler is a wicked guy or a righteous ruler, but we are to respect those who are in governing authority. Remember the uh, statement from Band of Brothers? I think it was made in, in connection with Lieutenant Sokol. Sokol. Guys hated him. He was an incompetent leader. And, and some of the guys did not want to salute him. And yet Dick Winters, one of the heroes of the story, said, you, you don't salute the man, salute the rank. And, so, and that's the emphasis of, script, of Scripture. And clearly, I, I think in this situation, Paul lost his cool. And, and, and if, we, if, you, if you've ever struggled with this kind of thing, well, you're not alone. Um, I'm encouraged that Scripture does not airbrush, it doesn't airbrush out its blemishes of its saints. David's adultery, Peter's brutality when he hacked off the ear of the, of the high priest's slave, nor Paul's outburst here. But are you and I ever right to let someone verbally have it? to just let our anger loose. No, we're not. We are to uh, follow our Lord Jesus' example. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, who while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Let me just say, that. nothing diffuses an impulse to let someone else verbally have it quite like a consideration of how Jesus responded to his situations. What would Jesus do? I say that, but I struggle just as well as anyone else. But to bite our tongue, to trust the Lord. We come to verses 6 through 10, and we see that uh, Paul apparently quickly realized that he was not going to receive justice in this situation. And so he, he opts for an approach where he is going to divide 
He's going to divide this group. You see, Luke tells us in verse 6, but perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees. He opts for an approach where where he he is going to divide this group, and at the same time, he's also going to show the Romans the irrationality and the inconsistency of these Jewish leaders who, remember, Claudius Lysias is probably sitting there watching what's going on and listening to it all. Now, keep in mind, the Sanhedrin, like our U.S. government, was not a cohesive, united group. (laughs) It was not. It was not. We have our division with our Democrats and Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Um, They also had their deep factions. There were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were your your liberal religionists. They, They believed in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but they rejected everything else. They did not believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection, of course. They didn't believe in angels and demons, spirits, the supernatural. So they were your your religious liberals. On the other hand, there were the Pharisees who were your religious conservatives. They believed in the entire Bible as well as the traditions of the Jews. They, They believed in the afterlife. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels and demons and the supernatural. And you can see in verse 8 how that Luke, very, in a very succinct way, tries to summarize some of these differences. And, and it's in view of this deep divide that he knew existed that Paul cries out, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Well, that was like putting a match to the gasoline-soaked kindling. Because he knew, he had an idea what was going on. Luke tells us that a great uproar took off. A great uproar took off. Literally, a mega shouting, a mega shouting match took off. Um, Many ways, like the divide that we've seen within our recent election, right? We see there's an incredible divide within our country. Um, We live, and we hear it all the time on the news, we live in a polarized society. We do. Republican pitted against Democrat, liberals pitted against conservatives, Fox News watchers pitted against CNBC watchers, right? And it's easy to get sucked into the fracas. It's easy to get sucked into it and potentially lose your own sanctification. Is it? I think it is. It's easy to get sucked into the arguments. And I would be quick to say this. Yes, we must certainly have our biblical convictions regarding societal issues. We ought to. We need to. We need to think scripturally and biblically about such things. But we must be careful that we keep the main thing the main thing. That we're will- the hill that we're willing to die on. And what is that hill? It's the gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though Paul refers to the resurrection here to divide this group, what he did was still true. He was on trial for the gospel. Take the gospel out of the situation, and he really wasn't on trial. But he was on trial for the gospel. This last, I just, as I've been meditating upon this over this last week and and earlier, uh, Dwayne, who had uh, hip surgery, and by the way, Dwayne, if you're watching this, we greet you and praying for your, your healing still. Uh, anyway, Dwayne sent me this uh, email, and it had a picture in it of a marquee, a marquee probably outside of a church. You know those kind of marquees where they, they put the lettering in, and it tells the sermon title, or it gives some pithy statement. Well, the statement in the marquee was, was this. It said, the donkey and the elephant cannot help us. We must get back to the lamb. And that came to me, I think, on Monday, the day before the election. I thought, amen. I agree. Republicans, Democrats, you're not going to save our situation. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, that is going to really help anyone. <laughs> you know, the, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church, you know, the very factious group of believers there at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I increase, let me just say this, increasingly as I talk with people and we see this divide 
I don't want to get embroiled in some political argument with someone. I really don't. I want to be a witness to Christ. I want to point people to Jesus. That's what's most important. Well, we come to verse 11, and really I see verse 11 as, as the pivotal, the hinge pin upon which this passage turns. And, 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 and even though Paul had effectively put the kibosh on any further witness to the Jews there on that day, is that, you know, they just, you know, they had this uproar, and he's again taken into protective custody, and he is brought into the fortress Antonia once again. Can we not picture Paul as, he, as he's brought there into the barracks once again, as he sits there that night, that he's downhearted, he's dejected, he's discouraged. Why? Well, he had come to Jerusalem bearing this love offering with high hopes of just showing the Gentile love of the church to the Jewish believers of the church, but that was eclipsed by the suspicion that the, uh, the, the legalists within the church had toward him and, and that they discredited his, his message, and so that was kind of eclipsed. And, and also, he, he had high hopes of coming and being a witness for Christ to his beloved Jewish brethren, and they were rejecting him. And his vision for eventually going to Rome and, and preaching the gospel there, he's got to be wondering, how is that going to work out? So as he, as he sat there in the fortress that night, he was about as low as he could possibly go. But that's when the Lord Jesus came to him. Is this, isn't this true? If there's one thing our Lord knows to do exceedingly well, and he does all things exceedingly well, but if there's one thing in particular that he knows exceedingly well to do, it's to encourage the hearts of his servants when the hearts of his servants are at the very lowest. To encourage you in my heart. Just think of some of the examples we see within the book of Acts regarding Paul's life. In chapter 16, after he had had his way thwarted by the Holy Spirit to go into some of the directions that he wanted to go into Asia and into Bithynia, uh, that night in a dream he received a a vision directing him to go to Macedonia in chapter, in chapter 16, verse 9. In chapter 18, when he's there at Corinth, and he's fearful once again that violence is going to break out against him, and he, he's going to probably suffer. Well, Jesus came to him by a vision at night, and the Lord said to him, Don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and don't be silent, for I, I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And here in this situation, as he sat there within the fortress Antonia. Uh, notice what, uh, first of all, notice in verse 11, Luke does not say that he received a vision of the Lord, that he received a dream of the Lord, but the Lord Jesus stood by his side. Interesting, isn't it? Can Jesus still go back and forth from heaven to literally appear to his servants or people? It seems so. It seems so, before he actually returns in his second coming. I don't know, think about that. Think about that. But then, then the Lord says to him, take courage. Take courage. Look at verse 11. Take courage, for as you have been my, uh, as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Take courage. You know, Mark Twain once said, I can live for two months on a compliment. How much more ought a believer to be able to live on encouragement from the Lord Jesus. By the way, take courage, of course. You have a sense of what the, the word means. It's a brave word, according to A.T. Robertson. Be of good cheer, it's sometimes translated. It's used seven times within the New Testament, and every single time it comes from the mouth of Jesus. Every single time. Let me give you some examples. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, to the paralytic who is lowered through the roof by his friends, Jesus said, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, to the woman with a flow of blood, daughter, take courage. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 27, to the terrified disciples when they saw Jesus walking on the water and they wondered if it was a spirit, Jesus says, it is I, take courage, stop being afraid. In Mark chapter 10, verse 49, to blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus who was sitting there crying out, crying out, Jesus, son of David, help me. Finally, he got Jesus' attention, and Jesus said to him, take courage, stand up, come here, and he healed him. 
Well, let me just say this. Even though Paul's way, even though Paul's way looked blocked up to him, Christ's promise was sure. As you have witnessed solemn to my, solemnly to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must, you must, underline that, you must witness at Rome also. It was more than a promise. It was a divine certainty. You must witness. It was such that if, if the Lord said the same kind of thing about the Denver Broncos, the Denver Broncos must win the Super Bowl. We would only be wise people if we went over to, Ro- over to Reno and laid down our bets. Because it wouldn't be a gamble, it would be a certainty. It's that kind of must here. Okay? I like the Broncos too. So. And even though unbeknownst, unbeknownst to Paul, his course to Rome would not be a straight line because he's going to be taken to Caesarea and he's going to sit there incarcerated at Caesarea for some two years but he would eventually make it to Rome. Would Jesus not say the same thing to you and me when we're filled with fear and discouragement and loss of hope? Take courage. Take courage. And for us to say to our souls, as Spurgeon would probably say, you know, why this deep depression, this faithless fainting, this chicken-hearted melancholy? Look to your Savior. Hope in Him. And how do you do that? How do you take courage in Christ? You take courage in Christ by looking to his promises, looking to the promises of the word of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, for I will neither leave you nor forsake you. By looking to something like uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Well, very moving very quickly in the remainder of the chapter, we see this incredible providential deliverance of the Apostle Paul. What do we mean by providential or providence? What do we mean by that? We toss that word around sometimes. Well, think about it this way. There, is, there are essentially two ways, there are two ways that God can work or does work within this world. The first way is through miracle. That is where he breaks into and works contrary to the normal ordering of things. And the other way is through providence. What is providence? The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks the question, what are God's works of providence? And it answers it by saying, God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing of all of his creatures. And that's what God is doing. God is, he is, he is preserving He's holding all things together, even right now. Out there, you look out the parking lot. He's holding this world together. He's also governing, according to his wise counsel, counsel all of the events of human history. That's what providence is. I mean, the worldling says, "Good luck," right? Good luck, and and, and in so doing, they confess their belief that in chance that the. Uh, that the world is working according to a randomness, to a chance. Well, good luck. Good luck. According to the Bible, there is no such thing as chance. There isn't. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 says, the lot, is, the, the lot is cast into the lap, and it's every decision is from the Lord. The lot is like dice. Every throw of the dice is a decision from the Lord. We look at, we look at the throw of, of dice like... The, could there be anything more of, of chance than that? Well, no. Not according to the scriptures. Rather than saying good luck, may I encourage you to think about saying well, good providence. Good providence. God is in control of all things, and may, may you experience his blessing in your life. Not good luck. Well, Luke, Luke tells us, you can see in these verses, verses uh, 12 through 15, we see the plot that was hatched against the Apostle Paul. Forty of these Jews colluded together. I mean, talk about collusion. You hear about collusion. This was collusion in this plot to do Paul in. Apparently, they were not members of the Sanhedrin, but they, 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 formed the, they, they, they entered into this oath with one another. And the word that's used there, we would translate it this way, they, they anathematized themselves. They anathematized themselves. They pronounced a, a divine 
curse upon themselves if they did not follow through in this plot to see Paul killed. Okay? You see that. And the plot was essentially to get the Sanhedrin to request Claudius Lysias to once again have Paul brought before the Sanhedrin. Then, as he was on the way, he would be killed. Josephus, the historian, talks about how that at that time there were Sicarii. There were those knife men that would, uh, they would, they would go in amongst the crowd and, and, and they would have their daggers and they would knife someone in the back and then they would be away before anyone noticed what had happened. And that's what they, just, that's what they planned for Paul. Before he even cr crossed the courtyard of the temple and got to the official meeting of place of the Sanhedrin, someone would knife him in the back. But the plot was uncovered. As you can see, verse 16, but the son of Paul's sister, Paul's nephew, it's interesting, this is the, other than what Paul, he refers to himself as the son of a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, this is the only family detail that we have within the scriptures regarding Paul. It really is. And of course, we have a number of questions arise out of it as far as, uh, uh, was his nephew a, a Christian? Uh, or what was he doing there in Jerusalem? Uh, why did he want to help Paul? We don't know. We don't know the answer to a, a number of those questions, right? We just don't know. The word that's used in verse 17 for a young man is the same word that Luke uses in chapter 20, verse 9, of Eutychus there. Remember uh, the, the young man that fell out of the third story? And, and so most likely this ne young nephew of Paul is somewhere between 14 and 17 years of age. And uh, he somehow gets wind of this plot that is hatched against the Apostle Paul. And he goes into the fortress Antonia and warns Paul. Now keep in mind, Paul is not under, he's not max security there. Not like Peter in chapter 12. He is under protective custody and therefore friends, family could come and go into the fortress. And so that's why this young nephew was able to go into there. And then, of course, we see how that it works out that he tells Paul. Paul calls a centurion, tells a centurion that this young man has some news for the commander for Claudius Lysias. And, of course, the young man is brought to Claudius Lysias and tells him about the plot. What this situation shows us, doesn't it? It shows us, as does the rest of Scripture, that, that our Lord has his agents, he has his means of deliverance from any quarter, anywhere. North, south, east, west, it doesn't matter. Like Mordecai within the book of Esther, you know, deliverance can come from any direction. The Lord is not limited in any way. And in view of this, you and I can rest at ease. And your back's against the wall. You're wondering how things are going to work out, how you're going to pay your bills. You wonder about any kind of situation where you're threatened as a believer. You can trust the Lord. To bring rescue. To do what David said in Psalm 3, verses 5 and 6, where David said, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Well, we see how that the plot was foiled by Claudius Lysias. He was not born yesterday. It's a good thing he was a wise commander. And so he puts this thing together to get Paul to shuttle him out of Jerusalem at 9 o'clock at night, and he's taking him eventually to Caesarea that we see. That was wise on his part for a couple reasons. You know, first of all, if the Jews had discovered that he knew about the plot, they would have just simply come up with another plot. And also, he needed to work in such a way that he would not be accused by the Jews of favoring Paul against them. So he got Paul out of there. And he's taking him to Caesarea, some 65 miles away there on the coast. Notice the overwhelming military might that we read of there in verse 23. 200 soldiers, 10, 200 legionaries, the, the most hardened, equipped soldiers of that day, along with 75 cavalry members, those who were part of the cavalry detachment there at the cohort there, uh, there in Jerusalem, as well as 200 light-armed um, soldiers. Yeah. 
They're, they're, they're lighter armed guys. So all together, do the math. 470 guys accompanying Paul to Caesarea. They make it to Antipatris on the, on the first day, 40 miles away, kind of a halfway point between Caesarea and Jerusalem. But what irony. Think about the irony of the situation. Paul left Jerusalem more like a king than a criminal. Did he not? And also, he rode in style. He didn't walk. He was not, he was not drug all the way to Caesarea, but he rode on horseback that entire 65 miles. And also, you know, by the time he got to Caesarea, he's put up there in the praetorium of the governor, which was the old uh, castle. It was the old living quarters of Herod the Great. I've been there. Beautiful seaside location. There were far worse places to spend the next two years of your life. So even though, even though he probably would not have wanted to do something like that if he had been given the choice, but the Lord was working out his good purposes in, in Paul's life. Well, what's the main message from this passage for you and I? It seems to me the main message that the Lord had for Paul. For Paul, it was, Paul, just keep on keeping on. As you have been my witness in Jerusalem, you're going to be my witness in Rome. And what we're going to see from here on out within the rest of the book of Acts is that Paul is going to, he's going to proclaim the gospel to some of the highest governing officials of that day. And eventually before Caesar himself. An amazing thing. The point for you and I is to keep playing the Lord's gospel. Keep playing the part that the Lord has for you wherever you are at. Just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. The story is told about how, how the great Polish composer, pianist, Ignacy Jan Paderewski was his name. I don't know if you've heard this story before. But he was going to be doing this concert, this huge music hall. It was, a, it was a black tux, long dress gown, extravaganza, high society at this hall. And on this particular night that he was going to be playing a concert, a mother had brought her nine-year-old son there to, to watch the great Paderewski play the piano hoping that her young son, who was also learning to play the piano, would be inspired to practice. I can tell you that this story identifies with me because I took piano lessons for seven years against my will. <laughs> no, it didn't work. It didn't work. But that night, there at that concert hall, there was that fidgety nine-year-old boy sitting next to his mom. He didn't want to be there. And when his mom turned to talk to some friends close by, the impatient, impatient boy could stand it no longer. He got up. He slipped away from her side. He was attracted to the ebony black Steinway grand piano there on the stage. Bright lights, tufted leather stool seats sitting there. And he made his way up to the piano. And as the story goes, he got up there and he fearfully, timidly, saw the white and black keys, and he stretched out his hands, and he began to play chopsticks. And after a while, the crowd that would, has carrying on, they, they quieted down, and pretty much, you know, then the, the hard stares came out and the harsh words, what do you think you're doing? Get off the stage. But backstage, Paderewski heard what was going on, and he quickly grabs his coat, and he runs out on stage, and he comes up behind the boy, and as the boy is playing chopsticks, he begins to improvise, and he, and he, and he weaves in this, this fuller rendition of chopsticks on the piano going back and forth. Amazing music, and he kept whispering in the little boy's ears, son, don't stop, keep playing, don't quit, keep going, keep playing. And the people were mesmerized by what Paderewski was able to do through this young boy. And it's much like you and I, isn't it? 
we sometimes, we often, we want to quit. We want to... We're playing our chopsticks on the piano of life. We're playing it. The crowd is sometimes saying, give it up. Get off the stage. Cut it out. And the Lord is whispering in our ear, don't quit. Keep playing. It's my music. I'm playing my music through you to my glory. For I know my plans that I have for you. Plans for welfare and a future to give you hope. Let's go ahead and stand. Hmm. Yeah, don't, I know. Remember, your feet fall asleep. Let's look to the Lord. We confess to you how quickly and seemingly often that we become downcast and discouraged. Wondering if, if you are still working your purposes through our life. We thank you for your good word that tells us that you are. And that we can take comfort in the fact, Lord, that you are sovereign. You are having your way. You will be honored and glorified in us. That you desire us to continue to walk obediently with you. Lord, I, I don't know what my brethren here are all going through in their life, the levels of discouragement or encouragement, but you do. You know exactly where, where each person is at. You know exactly what you're working to accomplish within their life. Have your way. Have your way with us, we pray. May you be honored and glorified. Use us as lights within this dark world. All for your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus. Amen. And amen, everyone. Greet someone. Don't hurry off.